So this is an interesting bias that I want, want to discuss with you today that I think every one of us has probably experienced. So um, wh where did this bias come from? I thought I'd give you a little bit of background to start with. Well, uh, we know that human evolution started about four to seven million years ago and that our modern human brain probably appeared about 150,000 to 200,000 years ago. And most of this time when we were uh, evolving using that brain, we were what's called hunter-gatherers. And we didn't really even have agriculture until about 10,000 uh, years ago. So over our evolution, we probably spent about 99% of the time as hunter-gatherers. And we developed these cognitive biases, like the overconfidence bias that we'll talk to, about today, over this millennia because humans are adaptive. And we try to improve our species' chances of survival and procreation, and so we learned these behaviors. Now, uh, some people think that negative reasoning outcomes or, or this idea of biases uh, came about primarily because of the challenges that we faced as humans and maybe even the social and the political context uh, which in, within which we participated. And, and the fact that demands in those contexts made uh, we're making on our lives. So we kind of came up with a heuristic toolkit. Uh, heuristic is a rule of thumb. So what are the rules of thumbs that, that we could use uh, to survive in, in different situations? So we learned then how to apply those heuristics in given contexts. And uh, at worst, we, we may have generated some reasoning errors, but they tended to enable us to survive. Now, uh, one question is then, uh, given that we evolved through this hunter-gatherer uh, type of state of affairs, and we're where we're at today, and we seem to still have some of these biases, uh, are they really relevant? Well, we've got to start thinking about then uh, computers and their relationship to these biases and how they might support our decision making. So our brains are now about three pounds in weight. Uh, they've tripled in size in our history. And there's about 100 billion neurons in our brains. And it would take about 32 million years to count the connections uh, of just our cerebral cortex. So the, the brain is, is an amazing thing. And, and all the advances in artificial intelligence to actually duplicate the brain have a huge challenge to overcome. So what makes human tick, humans tick then? What, what makes us work the way we do? Well, we think that probably the, the brains that we've developed um, might, in a lot of ways, be impractical for the issues that, that we face today. Uh, we know that fear is pretty much our basic emotion. Uh, that's what's helped us uh, anticipate danger and avoid pain, which are very important things. And it's, it's fear is fundamental because uh, that's life is fundamental. Uh, without life, um, why, why use your brain? What, what, is, what is it all about? So if we die, everything else pretty much becomes irrelevant. So uh, one thing that we know is that social comparison probably served uh, early man pretty well. So for example, if you saw your neighbor and your neighbor had a lot of food and maybe you had a little bit of envy about your neighbor, you would look at uh, what, what it was your neighbor was doing to be able to generate more food or provide more food and, and adapt your behavior or learn from that behavior in order to improve your, your outcomes. So what this means today is that uh, for our emotions, we have a, a, a strong uh, desire to avoid fear. And the fear of loss is stronger than our anticipation of gain. So we tend to, to process information through shortcuts and filters in order to shorten the time that it takes for us to analyze things. We are always looking for patterns. Um, you, it's amazing how the brain just says, well, I think I've seen this before, and tries to match a new situation to a pattern that's been there. So here's some examples. Do you consider yourself a better than average driver? Well, one study showed that 82% of students do consider themselves better than average drivers. Now, that doesn't make sense. If 82% if are better than average, where is average? Another finding in, in the business literature in finance is that men are often overconfident than women. 
uh, in making decisions about cash flow and, and other types of issues. Overconfidence in the stock market can lead to too much trading and higher fees uh, for your accounts, as well as oftentimes you take too much risk because you have too much confidence in, in your decisions. And, and what we found also is the closer the odds are to 50-50, uh, the more our overconfidence bias ability will kick in to provide justification for our actions. So what's typically done uh, to examine overconfidence is a, a type of exercise that I'd like you to experience today. So I'm going to give you 10 questions and what I'm going to ask you to do for these 10 questions is pick a range of answers. So for example, I might ask you something about uh, how many years old a person was uh, and, uh, when they died, and you might respond by saying, well, it's between zero and 500 years. Well, that would be pretty confident in that, that range. You would have like 100% confidence in that. But what I want you to do is think about what range would you give where you're 90% confident. So nine times out of 10, what would the, would the answer fall in that range that you're going to give me? So uh, hopefully you have a piece of, of paper handy and you can write down some of these answers. Now I'm not going to tell you the answers until we get to the end, but let me go through the questions uh, that we have here for you to consider. First of all, how old was Martin Luther King Jr. when he was killed? So start by writing down the low age and then write down the high age and somewhere in between, with 90% confidence, you are thinking that the actual age was when Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. The next one is, what is the length of the Nile River in miles? So, um, we know the Nile River is pretty long. What kind of a range would you give to be 90% confident of your answer for the length of the Nile River in miles. Next, how many countries belong to OPEC? Of course, that's the uh, oil um, uh, consortium. How many company, countries belong to OPEC? Next question, how many books are there in the Old Testament? So give me a low number and a high number for the number of books in the Old Testament. Now we'll switch to uh, what is the diameter of the moon in miles? I know you have to recall a little bit of geometry here. What's the diameter of the moon in miles? Next, what is the weight of an empty Boeing 747 in pounds? So given a 747 jetliner, what is its weight in pounds? Again, a low and a high. Next, in what year was Mozart born? What year? The eighth question, what is the gestation period of an Asian elephant in days? Gestation period of an Asian elephant in days. Next to the last, what is the air distance from London to Tokyo in miles? Air distance from London to Tokyo in miles. And finally, what is the deepest known point in the ocean in feet? The deepest known point in the ocean in feet. All right, hopefully you have your answers written down or you can uh, stop the video and think about those a little bit more uh, before we go on. So what is the overconfidence bias? Well, we tend to place too much faith in our knowledge and our abilities when we have too much overconfidence. We believe our thinking contribution to some decision is more useful than it probably really is. And it probably pertains to how well you understand your abilities and the limits of your knowledge. But in general, we think we, we're pretty good decision makers and, and we can interact on all kinds of situations. One manifestation of overconfidence is the tendency to overestimate our standing on the dimension of judgment and performance. So when people ask us about the quality of our decision, we tend to overestimate uh, that quality. There's another concept called the illusion of control that overconfidence uh, manifests in. 
And that's the tendency for people to behave as if they might have some control uh, when in fact they actually have none. So that's called the illusion of control. Next is a, a concept called the planning fallacy. And that's a tendency where people overestimate their rate of work or they underestimate how long it will take them to get things done. And it appears the strongest in our, most, in our longest and most complicated tasks, but it tends to disappear or reverse for simple tasks that are quick, quick, uh, quick to be completed. So what are some of the business implications? We've cited a few uh, as examples of bad situations. Um, and here are some more. One outcome of overconfidence is missed deadlines and delayed projects because of account, on account of what we just referred to as the planning fallacy. Uh, we think things will get done sooner than they can. Uh, another area where overconfidence will play a role is in negotiations. Uh, if we think we're going to win and we go in hard, that may have an impact, overconfidence may have an impact on the outcome of those negotiations. Of course, it's going to also bias our profit forecasts. If we think we're going to make a lot of money as a company in the next period uh, and we're overconfident in that, that may come across and could cause us some issues. Now we'll switch to entrepreneurs. It actually may change entrepreneurs' uh, way that they respond to new information. And it might affect how they represent their company when facing new strategic partners or potential customers. So um, it's kind of an interesting phenomena for entrepreneurs, and we'll exp explore that a little bit more in a minute because maybe there's a little bit of a flip side to that. Uh, one thing we also know about overconfidence is that companies can collapse when there's substantial lack of congruence between the, the perception of their environment that they're in and they're competing in and the actual environmental context that, that's at play. So there's a lot of business implications of overconfidence bias. So let's, let's take a look now at that flip side. Um, we have to acknowledge that overconfidence might be a good thing a little bit when it comes to starting a new company. You almost have to be overconfident in your abilities to take that huge amount of risk. And, and it requires a lot of courage to start a new venture. And, and you tend to overrate your abilities compared to others. Uh, so it forces an entrepreneur to move forward with a project. But you kind of have to be realistic as an entrepreneur too, uh, because when faced with, uh, for example, venture capitalists who might fund you, that could become a big issue. So some have suggested that, that not just confidence, but overconfidence, or, or being really better than you are in reality is because it, it serves to increase your ambition, your morale, your resolve, your persistence, maybe how, how good you are at bluffing, uh, and you tend to maybe generate a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, when you have this overconfidence. So there's a little bit of a, a, a trade-off here. You don't want to be too unconfident uh, or lack confidence or be too pessimistic. So uh, there's a balance here, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship. So an, another thing that comes to bear is a lot of people think as uh, uh, maybe there's another factor at play in the, in the overconfidence world, especially when it comes to, to entrepreneurs. And what they say is really uh, a lot of times it's a little bit of luck that you need. Uh, that you could be overconfident, but you're lucky enough to encounter the right kinds of problems and your, your inflated self-assessment in those uh, contexts yield you enough success to keep your confidence going. So maybe that's not such a bad thing, but I think a lot of the scholars believe that luck may have a big role in this too. So finally, here are your answers to the questions. And I'll let you grade yourself to see how well you did. And the thing that we want to look at here is uh, to consider the fact that I asked you to give a range such that you were 90% confident for each of the questions that, was, that were posed. And so by providing 90% uh, ranges on each of those, quest those questions, uh, in your answers, what we would have expected is that you should get 9 out of 10 of these uh, questions correct, right? 90% of the answers should be correct. So 
I'm interested to see how well you did. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if you're maybe in the 60, 50 percent, maybe 70 percent if you're pretty good rank. And uh, I, I just want you to know that that's pretty common. And it certainly demonstrates uh, the overconfidence bias at play.